Okay, now we're going to start looking deeper into dragons here a little bit. Uh, this will be like part two in the installment, and uh, hopefully you've seen part one. I thought it was pretty interesting. You get to see me actually kill Tiamat, the seven-headed dragon, although I do die in the process. Uh, but I save everyone. And uh, come in second on damage, too. Even though I'm not paying attention, I'm yakking, and I didn't even get the blue orb. <laughs> but anyhow... Um, which would have been a, a bonus and would have kept me from dying on the way running up to the blue dragon head on the third one, by the way. Anyhow, um, we're going to look into the Leviathan. And uh, Leviathan has, a, there's a lot to this, so let me just start beginning. Uh, Leviathan is uh, bought from the root form Levi. And Levi is, of course, attached to the um, brother of Moses, Levites, the Levitical priests, which, of course, were not the Hebrews themselves, but the ruling people over them that were the Levitical priests that weren't just for these Hebrews and these nomadic tent people, but of the entire Levant. And that's where the Levitical priests concept comes from. Uh, here we see it as Leviathan, but strangely, the... Hebrew set on it is Aten, Levi Aten, like as in Egypt, Leviathan, Leviathan, a creature with the form of a sea monster from Jewish beliefs, referenced in the Hebrew Bible in the book of Job, in Psalms, and the book of Isaiah, and the book of Amos. Indeed, there's a few stories in there about being in the sea and things like that. And these are all Canaanite concepts and ideas and weren't from the nomadic wandering people in the desert. But let's continue. The Leviathan of the book of Job is a reflection of the older Canaanite Lotan. Now, Lotan and Leviathan. So you can get the Levites getting that. Um, and look. Lotophages is where Lotan comes from, and those are people described by the Greeks. They're a little bit farther around and just on the bottom edge out of the delta area of Egypt. But and it means lotus eaters, but we won't go there now. Lotan is a servant of the sea god Yam, uh, which uh, and uh, defeated by the storm god Baal Hadad in the Ugaritic Baal cycle, possibly with the help or the hand of his sister Anat. Now, a knot is uh, looked at as being Inanna, or Diana, or what we know of as Venus. A knot also shows up prominently in the Egyptian mythos, and she is the sister who uh, was a daughter and goddess of grain and love and turns into a goddess of war, and indeed that's what happens to Diana. We'll go into that deeper later. Lotan seems to have been prefigured by the serpent Tem-Tum, represented in Syrian seals from 18th to 16th century. And, of course, that's Tiamat, who we had already talked about before. And, of course, the Tiamat is uh, the essence of the concept of Hydra, where when you cut off a head, it grows it back. Hopefully you got it in the first video, the idea that whenever they tried to take over Sumeria, they couldn't take it over um, and uh, because they also had different gods over different cities and wasn't quite unified in that effect and um, so what they had to do basically was run down through there in like a Alexander the Great situation and pretty much take them out and then wipe them all the way out but then pull them out of that situation and if you remember my one that I talked about on tablets here recently it showed you how they had gotten displaced and pulled out of there and shunted to the west. And the people that came in there were not the original Sumerians. And they were an Akkadian blend from them on. And uh, the Elamites. But let's continue here. Um, Leviathan in the book of Job is a reflection of the older Canaanite Lotan, a prim primeval monster defeated by the god Hadad. Parallels to the role of Mesopotamian Tiamat defeated by Marduk have long been drawn in comparative mythology. But I want to mention here again, this is the cycle that they have for the Sumerians. Tiamat and Bahamut fought and created actually the universe and our planet here. And we are a piece of Tiamat and... Key, 
right? Together we become key, but key is actually a portion of Tiamat, and the rest of Tiamat is strewn out into what is the asteroid belt and the missing planet that we find that should kind of be there. And in their terms, that and Bahamut become the Milky Way. And of course, Bahamut becomes this idea of concept of Nibiru that we have, where it can all happen again. And this is this cyclic thing that they have of the world getting destroyed by what looks like a giant asteroid impact or a cometary impact. And it does it again, of course, if you've looked into my videos, it does it again back at around 10,500 BC. And then there's a promise that it'll never happen again. Inki is controlled that the sea god uh, Yam, which is really Apsu or down in the abyss. That was the first inkling of all any of this. And then we have um, how it grows and turns into Tiamat and um, it does flood again, and then, of course, Abraham leaves, and so on, but we're not going to go there today. Um, it's been compared as the wider comparisons to a dragon and a world serpent narratives such as Indra slaying Vitra or Thor slaying Yorgaman there, but Leviathan already or later figures in the Hebrew Bible as a metaphor for a powerful enemy also, notably Babylon, and some scholars have pragmatically interpreted it as referring to a large aquatic creature such as a crocodile, and I'll show you how that connects here shortly. Uh, the word later uh, become to use the term for a great whale, um, as well as sea monsters in general, and uh, indeed it still carries all the way through to Captain Ahab, for a reason, uh, Captain Ahab, and Moby Dick, and the great white whale that is a symbology that people just don't catch into. But you'll find that this symbology of this sea monster and this Leviathan thing starts off at the sea god um, of the Sumerians and spreads from there and Indeed, during the cycle, it says he gets defeated. Well, Inky gets displaced by Enlil, and it continues from there. Then they have Ninurta take over, and that's the, really the third set of the cycle. And then you also have Marduk coming in later than that. Now, uh, an interesting thing, there's this picture over here, so let's show you this. This is from 1120. And if I didn't tell you that, and I told you the name of this was Liber Floridus, or live in Florida, you'd think, well, Florida has crocodiles, and here's a story of a crocodile-looking thing with scales on his back, only they got wings and crap on him. What is this? Well, of course, they have to have the volcano. This is where they keep correlating in volcano gods of the serpents of the earth and sea creatures and serpents, and, of course, that equates to our concept of dragons right? And he's got horns on him here and everything else. Well, what is this? Well, it tells you right here that it's Intepix Sidens Super Leviathan Serpente Diablo. Or in other words, this is the leader seated upon the giant Leviathan serpent of the devil. That's odd, isn't it? Down here at the bottom, it tells you the same thing. Uh, Uavithon Serpente Un Mare Un Eferet on Belus and Belta. Now, odd thing that it shows you here. This is 1120. We don't know anything about Florida, but uh, Mare is the ocean. Mar, Ulamer in French. Um, Mary in the Bible. Maritime. I've said this repeatedly in my videos that Mary is a signification of water. God's face, however, to bow the face of the waters and that created life. It did it again to form Jesus, uh, you know, because it was supposed to be a virgin birth. Anyhow, but then they mention that this guy who is going to be the leader and his name is Bellus, that's Baal, right? And here we have an idea of the devil. 
Now, the devil back here is not the red pitchfork guy that we have currently. That, of course, is an odd depiction of even trying to undeify Inky even more. And the original guy to Neptune Poseidon, who has a trident, because if you look, the devil has a pitchfork. He lives uh, under the earth now, and he causes... Um, all the earthquakes and the problems and he's got hell and all this stuff going on to it in Hades and of course this is the volcano magma situation and back again it all stems from Typhon which I have coming up I don't know I may release it before this but uh, there's another red-headed god of antiquity and related to the tribe of Dan which I'm trying to get the completion of also I've got another one to do on that but here we see this iconography and it's in Florida now, Liber Floridus actually means to live in Florida. Well, what's Florida? Well, Florida's the land of the flowers, and this is before Rosicrucians, so you can attach it to that. But it sounds like we're talking about Florida, and Florida's got crocodiles. And uh, I've seen people make that conjecture before, and I can't get away from its startling possibilities here. It's almost as startling as the pointy-ass shoes this guy's got on. But let's continue. I'll tell you that uh, the name Leviathan is a derivation from the root Levi to twine or to join, so that's what that means, with an adjective suffix I, which is a literal mean of wreath. So live, the concept of live is to twine or to join. To marry someone is to live. To live is to die. To oh, I'm not going to go into the poetry crap. Anyhow, with a literal meaning of wreath, twisted in folds, both the name and the mythological figure are a direct continuation of the Ugaritic sea monster Lotan. And Lotan, Leviathan, right? Lo, uh, of course, like the Lo and the Lota and Lotai were the um, Greeks even spoke of them. They called them the uh, Lotophagi, which means lotus eaters. We're not going to get into that now, but that would have been people that were a little south of this and around the bend over in through the delta of Egypt and where the Nile comes out into. Anyhow, most scholars agree that Lotan is um, one of the servants of the sea god Yamu or Yam, and uh, it's part of the Canaanite pantheon, defeated by Baal Hadad in the Baal cycle. Um, the Ugaric account gives gaps, little small gaps, making it unclear whether some phrases describe him or other monsters at Yamu's disposal, such as Tananu, the biblical Tanin god, uh, or sea creature. Now, here what we have is uh, Neptune releasing the Kraken, right? And so, are we talking about the sea god, or the people that had control of the sea, that had conquered the sea, the gods of the sea, these Phoenician people, right are we talking about just natural events are we putting both of them together and talking metaphorically quite often but not always and that seems to be more the case most scholars agree on describing lotan as the fugitive serpent that's listed in the bible but he may or may not be the wriggling serpent or the mighty one with seven heads Again, the seven-headed idea goes back to the Tiamat. Whenever you can't cut off all of its heads correctly at one time, they grow back. And the Sumerian Babylon that's supposed to be so bad um, was five major cities turned into seven. In fact, so it didn't get defeated. You can't defeat it. It keeps coming back and so on. And well, of course, looking through real true history, it came back as the Akkadians. It came back again as the Babylonians. And these weren't exactly the same people anymore. But they were still a force to be reckoned with and somebody that uh, these others saw as a problem. Enough to make up all this crap about it, right? Sea serpents figure prominently in the mythology of the ancient Near East. Duh! They are attested by the 3rd millennium B.C. in Sumerian iconography depicting the god Ninurta overcoming the seven-headed serpent. Um, and I tell you again that that was actually the third-fold idea 
The first one is Tiamat and Bahamut making the earth and key itself and the universe. And then so, oh, I didn't mention it whenever you're looking at that picture. Um, it's also said that we uh, stand on, there's a primordial idea that uh, Tiamat is in there in the waters. And so sticking up out of the water um, is the land. And so we stand on the back of Tiamat. And if you look at that iconography of that guy who was Baal or Bellus, he was standing on the back of Tiamat. So it even shows up there, and that's 1120. But that's toward the end of the Dark Ages. And not too long after this, the devil gets twisted into this red guy with a pitchfork and all nine yards, right? All right. Now there's a seven-headed serpent. We've talked about that. It's common for Near Eastern religions to include a chaos camp. Uh, this is a story where chaos forms everything into normal. Um, you know, people were running around crazy. Now it's all fixed. Um, oh, everything got screwed up. Now we have order and bringing things to order. It's definitely one of their things that they show in a repeated concept and sometimes repeated over and over again. Cosmic battle between a sea monster representing the forces of chaos as a creator of good, or the culture hero, forces order by force. The Babylonian creation myth describes Marduk's defeat of the serpent goddess Tiamat. And so you see this here, but the iconography here, do you see that he's got this lightning bolt again, which is the lightning bolt of Zeus that also Ninurta is given. Now Marduk is not a storm god. He's uh, supposed to be Jupiter, but Ju what? Jupiter is the storm god. Well, duh. But he is supposedly given that gift from their storm god to use. Like, they all cower in the face of Tiamat, but he goes and kills it off, and then he becomes the supreme ruler. So that's the cycle that you see with Marduk. Um, anyhow, whose body was used to create the heavens and the earth. Right, so you can see that they do have that iconography. The Leviathan is mentioned six times in the Tanakh, in Job a couple of times, in Amos, Psalms, in Isaiah. Hopefully you can see the numbers up there. I know it's small. Job 41 is dedicated describing him in detail. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? Psalm 74, God is said to break the heads of Leviathan, in one case it says seven heads, into pieces before giving his flesh to the people of the wilderness. I've made comment on this before, but uh, so either they, they killed a bunch of crocodiles that were plaguing an area, okay, and we're giving that to this warrior guy, and then that gets way deified later, or is it the seven heads of people, and when they killed them, they chopped up the meat and they gave it to unsuspecting people of the wilderness. Was this cannibalism and unknown? Was this, I sure hope it wasn't. And of course, if we create this to the god Inky and Neptune and things like that, it's kind of horrifying for me, huh? Just to think about it. I've looked into it deep and I cannot figure out exactly which way to twist it with that would fit better. But it does definitely say that, uh, that he fed his flesh to the people of the wilderness. And uh, I've discussed whether that's not whales, whether, you know, what that is. And I think it was crocodiles indeed in the heads. And there was perhaps seven of them. And they're going to say, oh, or maybe they're just equating that because they're equating it to Babylon, of course. Now, uh, God is praised for having made all, claim, all things, including Leviathan, in Psalms. So it's basically saying, like, all the great things of the world, da 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 you know, and uh, that he even created elephants. He created all these things, and uh, great and small. In Isaiah, he's called the tortuous serpent, who will be killed at the end of time. It's looked at as being the dragon that's listed and stuff in revelations and how it's all going to come to pass again that he's around the world in a circle and then he's going to screw up the whole world again or whatever somehow he's going to crack the egg that is the firmament when they used to believe there was a crystal dome above the earth 
course, if he's around the whole earth and it's made like a snow globe, doesn't quite make sense. But anyhow, um, the mention of tannins in the Genesis creation narrative, translated now as great whales in the King James Version, and Leviathan in Psalms, do not describe them as harmful, but as ocean creatures who are part of God's creation. The element of competition between God and the sea monster and the use of Leviathan to describe the powerful enemies of Israel may reflect the influence of the Mesopotamian and Canaanite sea monster legends or the contest in Egyptian mythology between Apep snake and the sun god Ra. So you can see this echoes out here in different forms. Alternatively, the removal of such competition may have reflected an attempt to naturalize Leviathan in a process that demoted it from deity to demon to monster. And indeed, whenever the snake shows up in the Garden of Eden, right, the serpent, he curses him and he says he's going to make him bad. My inky Enlil interpretation of the story there shows you how everybody was a worshiper of Enki, and how were they going to get him to worship this storm god? He said that he's going to cause drought. And of course, they'll start worshiping him because he's the one that causes the rains, even though Enki's the water god. And that'll, you know, make them want him more. It causes repeated problems. And he says he's going to deify him. He's going to make them into something everybody hates. Well, the snake or serpent thing goes with it, and it was a deal of knowledge and all this stuff that had been passed down. But slowly but surely, snakes get to be bad. In fact, it's going to bite you on the heel, and all these things come out of it, right? But original snake worship is pagan as hell. But then again, the people of the Bible are doing this like crazy for a good long time. And where it originally or originates from are also doing it for a good long time. I've explained that goes back through caveman times. Anyhow, um, later Jewish sources describe Leviathan as a dragon who lives over the sources of the deep and who, along with the male land monster behemoth, will be served up to the righteous as a meal at the end of time. The book of Enoch describes Leviathan as a female monster dwelling in the watery abyss as Tiamat, while Behemoth is a male monster living on the deserts of Dunedin, and uh, which is Dunedin is e would be east of Eden. And what is that? Well, that's going to end up being a one-horned rhino, but uh, and perhaps their elephants. We'll get into that one here shortly too. But we're on Leviathan. When the Jewish Midrash explains of the Tanakh were being composed, it was held that God originally produced a male and female Leviathan. But lest in multiplying the species should destroy the world, he slew the female, the Yahweh did, reserving her flesh for the banquet that will be given to the righteous at the advent of the Messiah. And so he supposedly, they'll even go as far as to tell you that they salted the fish. And that they tell this story whenever they salt fish to be preserved, right? Rashi's commentary in Jesus 121 repeats the tradition, the sea monsters, the great fish in the sea, and in the words of Agda, um, this refers to Leviathan and its mate, for he created them male and female. Male and female, he created them like it says in the Bible, and he slew the female and salted her away for the righteous in the future. For if they would propagate, the world could not exist because of them. Right? In fact, it's written that in the word Leviathan, the final yud, which denotes the plural, is missing, hence the implication that the Leviathan did not remain two, but its number was reduced to one. In the Talmud, Baba Bathra it is told that Leviathan will be slain and its flesh served as a feast of the righteous at the end of time to come. Well, I don't want to eat whale meat. I don't want to eat crocodile either. I've actually tried alligator tail and uh, not so much. You know, it's like chewy chicken or whatever they say. But if we're going to have chewy chicken, I'd rather have chewy chicken. Anyhow, uh, 
its skin will be used to cover the tent where the banquet will take place. Now, back whenever they said this, this is the prophecy. So back then, they couldn't even see past the point of living in tents. So you, you see some realities that come out and things like this, if you just pay attention, that it'll cover the tent where the banquet will take place. Well, well, they're just going to have an outside tent like they do, you know, at wedding receptions sometimes and everything. No, that's not the, what they're saying. They're saying that the banquet will take place in a tent. The festival of Sukkot, which is the festival of booths, are being able to sell things, usually... Um, towards the time of harvest here. When's exactly the date that it gives for Sukkot? It's uh, commonly translates the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, Ak, uh, the Ashkenazi pronunciation is Sukkos, also known as Chang's Ahisif, the Feast of In Gathering, a biblical just holiday celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month. Okay, so, so it's uh, right there. It's basically your harvest time, and then they're selling things at their booths and doing things like that. It says, May it be your will, Lord our God and God of our fathers, just as it I have fulfilled and dwelt in the sukkah, may I merit in the coming year and to dwell in the sukkah of the skin of Leviathan next year in Jerusalem. So they're saying, you know, let, let the end of time come over and over again. And this was an idea when they were supposed to try to take back over from, you know, Greek and Roman rule, and of course before that Babylonian, in fact, that area never really was theirs. They were always under foreign rule. Um, interesting, the little picture up here is a whale, and it said it's supposed to be Leviathan, but if you look, it's a man sitting inside of a whale. It's supposed to be Jonah, and Jonah is actually sitting there uh, reading something. So, um, just strange. Um, they talk about how giant the monster was. They had horns upon which was written, I'm one of the meanest creatures that inhabit the sea. I'm 300 miles in length and enter this day into the jaws of Leviathan. Right? The Leviathan is hungry, reports Rabbi Dim. He sends forth from his mouth a heat so great to make the waters of the deep boil. And if he would put his head into paradise, no living creature can endure the odor of him. Strange thing there is that he called the world we live in now paradise that it was already over with, but that if this creature was to stick, his, that he would stink. I'm guessing like if they smell a dead well, somebody has made these things. They tell you that his abode is in the Mediterranean Sea and the waters of the Jordan fall into his mouth. And it shows you where they're at and the Phoenicians and the God of Poseidon and Sidon itself is right there, and Po was its king at one time before a flood. I think uh, <clears throat> I think we'll cut to the other thing and show you the rest of it here. But uh, they'll tell you that Joah, Jonah narrowly avoided being eaten by the Leviathan, which eats one whale each day. And so uh, Jonah, by getting out on the third day, would have been eaten, by the way. There's all kinds of uh, Jewish midrash and stories that go along with this that if you really look it up, looks kind of uh, uh, kooky a little bit uh, there. But uh, so Leviathan, after a while, is this type of creature here, and he's going to swallow the people at the end of time, right? It caused this huge problem. But now they tell you Leviathan can also be used as an image of Satan, endangering both of God's creatures by attempting to eat them and the God's creation by threatening it will be the upheavals of the waters of chaos. St. Thomas Aquinas described Leviathan as the demon of envy, first in punishing the corresponding sinners uh, by eating them, like you see here, and stuff. So it's going to be, you know, the thing in the second coming, what's going to happen, and it all starts from the same thing that it began from, and it's that's the great, you know, Alpha and Omega here, and it comes off of who? Well, it's saying now that the Alpha and the Omega is this Leviathan creature that had struck the earth that caused it in the first place. Well, modern science believes that the reason that we are the way we are, we got struck by another planet in primordial times. Perhaps it's what became the asteroid belt. We got the moon from that, which if you look in my Tiamat story, 
the Kingu is basically shown in that story too. It's depicted out. And these gods, these stars, these moving stars, wandering stars, known as planets now, um, are showing you each of these gods that are there overseeing us and going around and around this globe of Earth. And it's where this originates from. You can find this Hellmouth story. Happens everywhere. Anglo-Saxons ended up getting this from around, uh, they say, about 800 and all over Europe. This uh, sign of the apocalypse where this big hell mouth was going to come and devour people. It was going to be Leviathan. And uh, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, though, suggests in a footnote that Job... Was, so they just want to mention that uh, now they figured it all out because you can be all freaked out by the Bible that in a footnote that Leviathan may be the name for a crocodile. And in a footnote for Job 4.15, the behemoth may be a name for a hippopotamus or perhaps a rhino or maybe even an elephant. But anyhow. So there's a lot of interpretations they have in here. In fact, the, the sea muncher, the great whale, and Melville's Momy Dick that I told you about in modern Hebrew, the word now simply just means whale, but it didn't in the first place. And Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote a sonnet called The Kraken. And the Kraken is basically the Leviathan and its idea of where it sleeps in the ocean and comes and attacks that it lives in a coral dwelling and things. You can pause and look at that if you want to. Hopefully there are too much lines on the screen from this. Usually on this program it does. Anyhow, um, and so the Kraken, and now we have all the stories of the pirates and how they always believe that out there there be monsters. The ancient Phoenicians, of course, had this uh, story they would show on their maps, and they went around to everybody. They helped make other people make their maps because they told them about the coastlines, whether they were totally correct or not. You look at some of those old maps, but quite often, out the Pillars of Hercules and anywhere around that there was up towards the Vikings, towards Britain, there would be a sea monster. And all right, there'd be monsters there, you know, and I've even seen people say that, look, there's a sea monster there. It's right near Ireland, and therefore, there you go, your Scottish, your Loch Ness monsters right there, you know, and it's like, yeah, but that's because they used to trade with those people, and they didn't want anybody going there, so they said, if you go up there, there's a sea monster. They also told people you'd fall off the end of the earth whenever they knew the world was round, and a lot of people did at that time, and people bought that crap. In fact, we bought that crap. We buy that crap every day or um, uh, as we grow up, whenever they tell you that they said the world was flat and then Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 and he was supposed to fall off the end of the earth because it's flat. And then, you know, there's even flat earthers now. It's kind of freaky. But uh, let's go on. I'll show you something else here. Uh, this is the idea of Leviathan. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook, or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose, or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with a gentle word? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird, or put it on a leash for the young women of your house? Will traders barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? This doesn't sound like something that's just gigantic, but of course when you read the stories of Moby Dick and stuff, that it has that concept of um, you know, filling it full of spears before they go down in the harpoons. If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor, like you see here? It goes off into dragons in a minute, though. Watch. 
Who dares open the doors of its mouth? Ringed about with fearsome teeth, its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together, right? Each is slow, cl so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Now we go dragon. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from its mouth. That's the dragon. Now let's go back to reality. Strength resides in its neck. Dismay goes before it. The folds of its flesh are tightly joined. They are firm and immovable. Its chest is hard as a rock, hard as a lower millstone. When it rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before its thrashing. Um, the sword that reaches it has no effect. Nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron it treats like straw and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make it flee. This can tell you that this comes from the Iron Age or they would not speak of such things. It laughs at the rattling of the lance. And lances? Where do lances come from? Its undersides are jagged pot shards. Like the plates on the underside of the belly, which it talked about a minute ago leaving a trail in the mud like threshing sledge. Have anybody seen like the crocodile hunter where they grow, climb up and get out and how it leaves a track where it goes? It makes the depths churn up like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening weight behind it. Would one thing the deep had white hair? Well, this describes him as being as the ancient or an elder of days. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is king over all that are proud. Now, this is also, again, equating this to Babylon and trying to put that on there, that they are haughty and they are proud and da-da-da. It's like the Egyptians and stuff. Well, you know, you're supposed to exhibit some pride and it builds you up, it helps you. Um, it continuation uh, from football teams to nations people um, but then again I guess a humble tent people who are trying to cut some people down to make room for themselves perhaps might have that ideal against other people now wouldn't they anyhow look at this picture here it's a little bit throwing off. It looks like it's a little over 30, 35 foot here, but really those people are sitting back about five foot, so it's got a forced perspective concept going on, and it's believed that it's a little over 20 foot. Still just about the largest Nile crocodile ever seen on record, although there is a Discovery Channel one that's got one that's well over 20 foot that they can show you. I mean, he just literally takes down a wildebeest like it's nothing. Just stomp, and he just takes him down. Uh, there are people right now going out into this rock where this thing is laid on right now, and they're going to measure that where the rock is exactly so they can tell you how long that exactly was there. And I'm guessing that it's going to hit somewhere between 18 and 20, 21 foot, although it looks like 30 here. Uh, but again, so they killed Leviathan, here they did, and they fed it to the people in the wilderness. And are all these black people here fixing to have a barbecue on this or what? How does this work? Cajun people love to eat some alligator. Anyhow, people, like, share, and subscribe. And uh, this is your Leviathan. And you can see the dragon twist they put into it. If we merely take out two passages, it's exactly this creature. And then, of course, they put some connotations on it that attach it to people. And... This is your Leviathan. Peace.